In this video, we're going to look at an introduction to some of the concepts involved when you get into the 3D modeling side of Aspire. Firstly, let's talk about how we represent the 3D data. Essentially, what we're looking at is a grid of pixels and each one of those pixels is at a different Z height. And so the concept is exactly the same as the executive pin art toy, where you have pins that you can push a 3D shape into them and see that represented by the different heights of the pins being pushed up. And the difference with Aspire is that we are using a million or more points so that we can represent much more complex and smooth forms. Now we don't actually see each individual location and in the software we refer to these points as pixels and this really is the same terminology that you may have heard when people describe the points or dots that make up a 2D image and this really is the same concept the more dots you have the better quality image you have and so in the software the more pixels that you have the better quality the model that you will have. The quality setting in the software is referred to as resolution and you define this when you start a new session in the job setup form under the modeling resolution. And by default, we're presented with three options for this. First is your standard resolution. So this is where we apply 1 million pixels over the surface of your entire work area. And we've got high resolution and this is where we have 2 million pixels. And then we have very high resolution, and this is 4 million pixels over the surface of your entire work area. And so this really presents us with a trade-off, because the higher the settings means that we'll get a better quality model. However, it may mean that there may be longer calculation times for some modelling and toolpathing operations. And so you just have to balance it out so it's appropriate for the type of work that you're doing and the computer hardware that you're running. Now, resolution does not affect 2D or 2.5D content. That's all down to the quality of the vectors that you've drawn and the settings that you use in the toolpaths. Now, for people who are new to this, this concept can be a little bit difficult to understand. So let's just talk about some of the rules for success. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to maximize the area of the job that the 3D part covers. So you don't want to have lots of space in your job that is actually irrelevant to what you're actually machining. And so a good idea is to make the job size slightly larger than the parts that you actually plan to toolpath. And the reason for this is you want to leave enough border for your cutout tool to go around. So taking a look at this example here, you can see we've got this 3D model of this horse head and the rectangle that actually surrounds this horse head is the job size. Now what we don't want to do is we don't want to make the job size the size of the table or the material unless it's the size of the parts that you're actually cutting. So let's have a look at the two examples that we've got here. So here we have the horse's head and that's 10 inches wide and it's positioned within a job space that is actually 12 inches wide and so it's just a little bit bigger than the part that we've actually planned to cut. Now on this sheet we have that same 10 inch horse except that this time it's actually placed in a job size that is actually 4 foot by 8 foot and if we look we can see the quality difference that it makes to both of these models. Where the first horse we looked at, you can see we've got a very high quality model and that's because we're maximising the number of pixels within this work area so that the model can use that to get all of that definition. Whereas in our second example, the horse has been placed on a full sheet and so we're actually getting much fewer of those points underneath our model and so we can see that we're really sacrificing the quality of the model if we do that. So it's very important to maximise the area of the job that the 3D area covers. And a good idea is to look at the parts that you plan to toolpath and add in an inch or a couple of centimetres around the parts, assuming it's large enough to accommodate any cutout operations that you plan to do. And in some situations, you may want to look at rotating the parts to best fit the shape of your material in order for you to maximise the number of pixels being used. And this is something to think about if it appears that there is lots of white space. So once the part is set up, what is it that tells the software to push these pixels up to different Z heights? We use a concept called components. Now components are the words that we use to refer to the 3D objects in the software. 
When we create these components, that's going to push up the pixel heights in the software, and by combining these together, is how we get the overall finished object. But these are all managed in the component tree on the components tab. And the result of all of these individual objects combined together is what gives us something that we refer to as the composite model. And so this could be just a single component on a level, or it could be like the example that we've got here, where we have an assembly of many levels, groups and components. And what you see in the 3D view is the result of all of these components and their combined modes and how they're interacting with each other is what gives us the finished part. And that's what we're going to machine. So how do we generate these components? Now there are a couple of ways to do this. One way is that we could use the modeling tools in Aspire to create the different types of shapes. Now the model making tools that are available can be found on the bottom half of your design tab. And this is where we'd go to create our components. For example, you can create shapes using a variety of create shape tools where you can take a vector and you can look at building that into a flat, round, angled, smooth, or even a custom made profile shapes. You could also look at using the two rail sweep or the extrude and weave tool to create swept shapes. We could also even look at using the turn and spin tool to create spun and rotated shapes. We could also look at using the sculpting tools whereby we can edit a shape as if it were virtual clay. We also have the create texture area tool and that will enable us to create pattern components. We've also got the ability to create a model from an image and this is good for generating component textures. An alternate way to build in shapes from 2D data within the software is to go ahead and import the 3D model. Now this may be something that you've previously made in Aspire and saved it out, or it could be a piece of 3D clip art that you've purchased or downloaded from the internet, or it could be a 3D model created in another CAD program that you may want to bring in and finish and then create the toolpaths to cut it out on your CNC. So by working through all of the other modeling tutorials, you'll learn how to use each of these modeling tools. Now, when you're creating your job, what's the typical workflow? So the first thing that you're going to do is define your job concept and gather all of your reference material. So maybe this is information from your customer, or it could be things that you just bring together to begin your design. Then you need to create good quality vectors. All the 3D work will benefit from good quality vectors and everything that you've learned about vectors so far will ultimately help you to create good quality models. So the better the vectors, the better the model. And so with those vectors, you begin to build the basic components with the modeling tools. And as you build more shapes, you'll need to organize your components into sub assemblies. We can look at levels and groups and you can adjust the order of the combined modes and these components to then slowly build a more complex shape that's all managed in the component tree. Now, as you're doing this, you may use some of the editing tools to start to smooth and blend components together in order to get the shapes to interact with each other just the way that you want. And as with any project, iterate through where you may make changes for improvement until you get to the point where you have a part that's ready to machine. Now you may also want to apply some finishing touches, for instance, sculpting or smoothing and everything you need to do to get it machine ready. And so when your 3D part is in a state that's now ready to machine, it's time to think about creating the toolpaths to cut this out on your CNC. Now, the most common approach to machining 3D parts is by using two different toolpaths, where you'd look at using the 3D roughing and the 3D finishing toolpaths. Now, the 3D roughing toolpath removes the majority of the material around the parts using a larger tool, and it keeps it slightly away from the finished object to make sure that we've got some material left for the second type of toolpath, which is the 3D finishing toolpath. And this is what cuts the finished surface of the model. And using a smaller tool with a smaller step over, and so that step over is the distance between each path that the tool makes. And you can see that the lines are very close to each other, and so we get a better quality finish. Of course, the penalty for this is that it's going to take longer to cut out. 
As well as doing 3D toolpaths, you may want to combine these with 2D and 2.5D toolpaths. For example, you may want to run a 2D profile to cut around your 3D part. And there are some 2D and 2.5D toolpaths that can also be projected onto a 3D shape. For example, I may want to cut out a model of a banner, and so I'd run my 3D toolpaths first. And then using a V-bit, I could look at projecting the text onto the model with the V-carve toolpath. In addition to creating a 3D model to output to a CNC, you may want to export the 3D model to import into another CAD program. You may also want to export it to a 3D printer where you could save the model as a mesh so that you can 3D print it. So this concludes this quick overview of the general concepts behind modelling in Aspire and the typical workflow that we're going to use with it. Now, if you want to do this sort of work, then we definitely recommend that you watch all of the 3D modeling tutorials that we've got available. And we'll link you to some of those in the related videos section for this video. Thank you for watching.